Hey guys, I am on Patreon now, so feel free to support me there. Even if you're only vaguely familiar with film noir, you probably know a lot of its tropes. Where had I gone wrong? We need answers, see? I need to know who the jewel thief is, see? Suppose you tell me about it from the very beginning. Film noir is a catch-all term for the hard-boiled detective films of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, which often present us with an examination of the dark and lurid fantasies of a population on the verge of collective insanity. Early crime fiction, along with its screen adaptations that came later, torpedoed its audiences into the thrills and seductions of the criminal underworld and into nightmares of the surreal. Its archetypal characters and locations, along with iconic cinematic devices, have created a truly unique genre whose influence on filmmaking can still be seen to this day. It gave us the anti-hero, the femme fatale, the red herring, and countless other still-utilized archetypes. In this video, I'll be picking apart and examining the many motifs found within film noir, as well as unpacking the ways that those motifs were a reaction to what was going on in the U.S., particularly in regards to the Great Depression and the American Dream. I'll be using specific films as reference points, so if you haven't seen any of the films listed in the description below, consider this your spoiler warning. The origins of the hard-boiled detective drama can be traced back to a fertile mixture of influences. These include U.S. crime fiction of the hard-boiled variety, Hollywood gangster movies, German cinema of the Weimar years, and French poetic realist films of the immediate pre-war period. Though film noir does reflect significantly on this international influence, it was primarily the works of American authors such as Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, and James M. Cain that provided the paradigmatic characters, as well as most of the dialogue for future screenplays. I've always credited the private detective with a high degree of omniscience. Between 1941 and 1948, at least one-fifth of all film noirs were derived from hard-boiled crime fiction from the 30s. In analyzing these films as works of art, we must first understand the historical context of their time, the time in which the writer wrote them. In his book Dancing in the Dark, A Cultural History of the Great Depression, author and historian Morris Dickstein attributes America's love affair with crime fiction to pervasive nihilism. It plunges us into a world untouched by culture and conventional values, almost beyond good and evil. During the Great Depression, crime was becoming more and more relevant. Prohibition had turned anyone who refused to stop drinking into a criminal by law, or anyone who refused to stop gambling by that token. And the infamous gangsters of The Public Enemy and Scarface had further romanticized the world of the criminal. Frustration at the models of finance and business were higher than ever by the end of the mid-30s, and a life of fast crime was becoming more and more seductive to the average American. As Dickstein puts it, these hard-boiled detective writers could convey the harsh ironies that beset the lives of hard-pressed Americans during the lowest days of the Depression, not unlike the filmmakers who were making the gangster movies. The characters that appear in the numerous crime novels of the 1930s, as well as their screen counterparts, have become archetypes of the genre. The world-weary, quick-witted, embittered protagonist, often but not always a private eye, but sometimes a boxer, a gangster, a screenwriter, or a hitman who is lured into the criminal underbelly, often by a beautiful but treacherous femme fatale. I'm trying to find my sister. I'm asking you not to. I have to. No, not now, Bill. In a sense, these American detectives were a kind of repudiation of Holmesian-style English detectives, who were far more straight-laced and proper. Except for the cocaine and morphine. The detectives of the film noir era were far more biting and brooding. You're drunk. Get out! In his book Dangerous Men, Pre-Code Hollywood and the Birth of the Modern Man, author Mick LaSalle points out that it was a male genre. The movies were invariably about unhappy men. Women suffered from being in their company and sometimes suffered at their hands. But the men were the ones in torment. <coughs> These men exhibit a certain moral ambivalence. Their dry humor and lightning-fast dialogue is reminiscent of the ruthless gangsters in Little Caesar and the public enemy. You got me to take care of your husband for you. And then you get Zucchetti to take care of Lola. Maybe take care of me too. Then somebody else would have come along to take care of Zucchetti for you. That's the way you operate, isn't it, baby? Suppose it is. Is what you've got cooked up for tonight any better? In voiceover narration, the detective will often ponder and question his own morality. The joint looked like trouble, but that doesn't bother me. Nothing bothered me. The two twenties fell nice and snug against my appendix. The location for these stories is almost always the claustrophobic urban jungle, usually Los Angeles, Chicago, or New York, as to express the insufferable alienation of city life. 
Billy Wilder's double indemnity begins with a cold open, as all crime noirs do. The action begins abruptly, with a screeching car speeding through an empty Los Angeles. The film employs the typical narrative device of framing the entire primary narrative as a flashback, spoken in reflection by the protagonist. The leading man is insurance salesman Walter Neff, an intelligent, hyper-observant shark type. He falls for the sultry Phyllis Diedrichson, and together they carry out the murder of Phyllis's rich, overinsured husband. At various points in the film, Walter's thoughts are spoken in voiceover narration as he examines the minute details of his surroundings. So I let her have it straight between the eyes. She didn't fool me for a minute, not this time. I knew I had hold of a red-hot poker and the time to drop it was before it burned my hand off. What? I stopped at a drive-in for a bottle of beer, the one I had wanted all along. Yeah. Only I wanted it worse now. The dialogue between Walter and his boss Keyes is sharp, fast, and witty. The textbook hard-boiled back and forth. You delivered the policy to him personally, didn't you? Yeah. You got his check. Sure I did. Though the film was shot in 1944, the script stays true to the original novel in portraying an America racked by the Great Depression. It's seen at various points in the film. Down on their luck businessmen attempting to commit insurance fraud, the prospect of murdering for money, the elevator man who laments on the poor economy, and Walter even remarks how Phyllis's house will probably never be fully paid for. In framing her husband's death as an accidental death, Walter knows that Phyllis will be entitled to a double indemnity surplus of insurance money, some thousands of dollars extra. Like the many men of the early detective novels, Walter's gullibility and libido is what drives him to do it, as well as the unnerving desire to pull off the perfect crime. He seems discontent with mundane city life, and at first, he enjoys the thrill of meticulously planning the murder. He has a fairly misogynistic attitude towards Phyllis, and only really refers to her as baby. Sorry, baby, I'm not buying. As historical documents, these films exhibit a certain disconnect from their original novels. Because they were produced mostly in the 40s and 50s, the depression often went underemphasized or even ignored. The characters were never really out of a job and usually journeyed far below the surface of mainstream society into the obscure depths of lawlessness. So even though desperation and money is almost always the motive of the characters, rarely is the depression ever explicitly referenced. Another exemplary film noir is Murder, My Sweet, based on the 1939 novel Farewell, My Lovely by Raymond Chandler. Private Eye protagonist Philip Marlowe exhibits a much more gentlemanly character than Walter Neff. Philip Marlowe is somewhat of a smooth talker who swoons women and fools suspects into a false sense of security. Stylistically, Murder, My Sweet follows suit in narrating the entire story as a flashback and setting it in the seedy back streets of Los Angeles. In reference to this film, I examine the hard-boiled detective genre artistically. There are many identifying characteristics that are unique to the visuality of film noir. One of these is low lighting schemes, which results in stark contrasts of light and dramatic shadow patterning. Overall, these films are very dark, hence the term film noir, which is French for black film, and they were often shot on a very low budget. In truth, these films were originally only screened as B-list movies, second on the bill to cheerier personalities like Shirley Temple and Charlie Chaplin. These darker films also featured skewed and low-angled shots, a method popularized by the German Expressionist movement. In the film industry, these are now called Dutch angles. Film noirs also tend to have unique editing techniques that disrupt the narrative's chronology. As exemplified in some of the aforementioned films, the entirety of the action may be a flashback, or sometimes just the first half. The use of voiceover narration became a hallmark characteristic of the genre as well. Orson Welles' Citizen Kane pioneered many of these cinematic techniques, including his prominent use of deep focus, a technique in where all the objects of the room are in sharp focus, regardless of the interactions of the characters. Essentially, these are cerebral films, and they were designed to transcend its audience from the tedious norms and struggles of everyday life by creating a dreamlike, unnerving, bleak universe and following the psyches of characters that give in to our most forbidden and twisted desires. Characters who, like so many desperate Americans during the 30s, walk the tightrope between good and evil, pure and corrupt, law and lawlessness. In truth, these films did not serve to articulate or interpret the harsh fortunes of the Depression, but rather to implore audiences to examine their own morality and righteousness in light of a bizarre world, allegorical to our own. Its narrative and stylistic devices propose a dark worldview that confronts the prevalent nihilism of the Depression and where the idealism of America was shattered. 
many of the tropes of film noir can still be seen in films today. And there's a whole subgenre I'd like to do another video on called neo-noir. And these include films like Blade Runner, Blue Velvet, Brick, Chinatown. Interpretively, the noir crime drama also makes a case for the desperate criminal, whose dogged pursuit of money can be attributed only to the damaging conditions of a world run by banks. The private eye's world weariness is reflective, perhaps, of the embittered American citizen, whose growing distrust in the system might be rectified in the moral conflicts and biting personality of the hard-boiled detective. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into film noir. Let me know in the comments section below what you'd like to see me do a video on next. Thanks so much.